So it's time for figs. Figs are coming in. Uh, starting to they start to. Now, um, as far as fig trees go, I got that real big brown turkey one. And then I got about 20 to 30 other varieties. Some of four I planted last year, a bunch I planted this spring. Brown turkeys always come in first. We do. And they're kind of one and done. Some of these other varieties, like we've got the black malt or some of the LSU ones, they'll keep producing figs on up to, you know, through the fall a lot of times. The brown turkey is just, it's kind of like a determinate tomato. There's a lot of them, they pop and they're done. So we've been picking our brown turkeys and my wife made this the other night. So she went out there and picked some figs with the intention of making some uh, fig strawberry jelly which we make every, you make it with basically strawberry gelatin and then you, you pressure can it or hot water bath it, seal it up and you sit it on the shelf, whatever, use it for a while. However, there's a few ingredients she wasn't able to get at the local dollar store because evidently canning supplies are in pretty high demand. So she kind of switched her game up and made this fig jam right here. And if you follow our Instagram uh, channel or watch that Garden Goodies series on Sundays on YouTube, We'll do a little video series on how, how actually how we do this pretty soon. But this is a refrigerator jam. So this is not hot water bath. It's kind of like your refrigerator pickles. Um, and it has a shorter lifespan. I shorter think. lifespan. But it, once you taste this, you'll realize that you ain't going to have to worry about it. So all, all we did here is basically pick the figs. We put them in the Ninja blender, chopped them up a little bit. And I think she just used lemon juice, sugar, and water and just cooked them for a little bit. It's, got, it's more like a jam consistency, a thicker consistency. And uh, I figured we'd give it a try. I had some uh, yesterday. Yeah, I got some uh, butter toast here. And, and don't be bashful with it because well, I got plenty. But, so this would have less sugar in it than what your traditional. Yeah, yeah. It, that's going to taste more like figs and less like you know, straight sugar jelly. And the, oh, that brown turkey is not my favorite fig. It's the, probably the most popular, what most people have. Uh, and it makes a lot. It's a good tree to have, just to have a bunch of figs. But it's, as far as the flavor of it, it's not my favorite, but I do enjoy when they come in. It's delicious. And that's fast. She did that probably 30 minutes. Also, that would work well on a cracker with some cheese, you think? Cheese board, mm-hmm. Here, you might need, might need you one of them. Anyway, so we'll do a little step-by-step -step video series on how we make that right there. I appreciate that because I get more flavor of the fig in there and it's not overpowered by the sugar. And a little more texture, too. I do not like the real sweet, sweet jams or jellies the older I get, I find those are just too overpowering mm -hmm. the sugar in them. And I appreciate the flavor more than I do the sugar. Yeah, you eat fig jam, you want to taste, taste like figs and not sugar, jello. Anyway, that was a home run for me right there. It is. I'll let you keep that one. You want some that? You might, well, you might better keep all that over, over there. So we got that going on. Figs coming in. Um, my other ones are getting close. I'm seeing some little ones on there. Now them other ones, because those trees are small, they're not making a ton. I may pick four or five figs at a time off those smaller trees. Those figs usually don't make it in the house. Me and uh, old Ty Ty. Take care of them. A fellow yeah. told me a year or so ago about fig trees. He said the third year is the secret year. So it takes them two years to really get established and that third year is when they blossom and really start putting on fruit and you start getting that reward or that bounty or that harvest from them. So the third year on, I'll picture it. From my experiences, and I'm no fig expert, within the first two years, you about can't give them trees too much water. They'll soak, and the more water you can give them, the, the quicker they're gonna get up and go. I've also done a good job of fertilizing mine because I wanna, you know, I wanna create that growth Mm -hmm. I want to make plenty of, of boost to support, good root system there. So I fertilize them real heavy for the first couple of years. Now I've been using an organic fertilizer, mm -hmm. but I have kept them, make sure I kept them nice and green and keep a look at the leaves and I can look at the leaves until if they miss anything, if I need to pop something. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me also with them, we could, we could talk about figs all day here, um, is how the growth habit, even 
you plant two trees of the same variety, they'll just grow out completely different. Some of them will bush out, some of them will grow straight up. Uh, it's just a lot of variation in how they grow out. And I, you can prune them to make them kind of do whatever you want to, kind of like an apple tree. But it is interesting how some are bushy and some go straight up. You know, we live in the south and we have a lot of problems that people don't up north. I was up north earlier this week and the weather was really nice up there, no bugs. I mean, you could sit out there and have them and it was, it was just really enjoyable. But, you know, us living in the south, we have to put up some bugs and folks up north don't with them. But we also get to enjoy some things that they don't up north get a little bit right there. Mm. And that would be fig trees. They can't grow fig trees up there, but we get to enjoy fig trees in the ground. Now they can grow apple trees, but we can't grow apple trees. So we have to enjoy what we're blessed with, and fig trees we are blessed with here in the south. That's right. That's right. Let's see what else we got going on. Let's talk about this new merch real quick before we get into it. So, uh, added a few new shirts to the website here. That one there has been very popular. That's our Oakry shirt. Oakry. Now, a lot of people on my video have been telling me I wasn't saying okri right, but that's, that's just how I'm going to say it from now on. Okri. okri. And then we got this one here, which has got the logo on the front and the graphic on the back. I'll turn around. Everybody can see it. This one says, mm, hashtag, grow your own food. Yep. So we got those two on there. One more to go. Um, we got a wheel hose shirt coming and in that one i do have some larger sizes for those people that have been wanting the three and four x and we'll get some larger size in these once we do another print run just kind of feeling it out seeing what our volume needs to be the straw hat sold out boom within hours boom, boom. uh got more of those ordered might be a few weeks we're gonna get those in we showed everybody the pepper bandana last week we got an oak tree bandana now I've not seen this. You haven't? I have not. You've been out of town for I've a few days. Town. You've been missing out. So yeah. we got that on the site along with the pepper bandana. So this pepper bandana is kind of off-white color. It's a nice little kind of bluish gray here. I like that one. Keep you nice and cool on them 95 degree days. What else? Oh, a few things I want to show going on in my garden. And I, I meant to bring a yellow one but i didn't have any of those that were close to being ready because we just picked them so i got three all three of our round zucchini varieties growing and I, these are different size for a reason here so this is the cue ball the one ball was the yellow one it's really really pretty but i didn't have any of those uh ready to pick yet this is the eight ball this one here I want to show you what the ideal size is to pick these things. This is your ideal size to pick them. Pool ball size or billiard ball size or just a hair bit bigger. This one here has done got too big. That's chicken food. Chicken food. Now you can take this. These are zucchinis, folks. So they're going to taste just like a, a regular long zucchini. You can take this and make you some zucchini bread. It works good for that. But as far as storing on the grill, it's probably going to be a little... Pithy. Pithy. And that's a word that you probably need to understand. Pithy. Kind of spongy. Spongy inside. When so you get pithy, then they've moved on to chicken food. So you can salvage these. You can make zucchini bread with them, feed them to the chickens. That right there is your ideal size. I will say of the three I have, these here are a little bit more sensitive to being scratched or blemished. You got to be a little careful when you're picking these and putting them in the bucket. They'll get the skin, see right there? Mm -hmm. Skin's a little tender on them and they'll, they'll uh, blemish up on you. But they're really pretty and um, really been enjoying those. I like growing all three of them, having all three colors. We've been putting them in our vegetable bags, kind of one of each color. Nice little medley there. Oh, yeah. Did you bring anything from your garden? Well, I did. So, you know, it's, it's that time of year when everything's coming in. I've been going for a couple of days and I come back and boom, boom. Boom, boom. Something doesn't happen. Something doesn't happen. Uh-oh. So, my watermelons is ready. Uh-oh. Your sangrias? My sangrias are ready. That's the first year growing up. That makes a pretty... It's a pretty decent sized watermelon. It's a nice floor. I got a little sun on it right there, which is okay. It didn't hurt a thing. 
Now, I did a video a few years ago, How to Tell When Watermelons Is Ripe, and you can go watch that video. I believe it's titled, How to Tell When Watermelons Are Ripe. It's one of our most popular videos we've ever done over And I the talk years. about the curlicue in that video where he comes up there and it dies off. Now, that can be a little misleading on your first crop or two that comes in, your first watermelon or two. You gotta let that curlicue die all the way back and maybe give it a couple of days after that. But then from there on, it's a very good indicator. I'm gonna show you another good indicator to tell when watermelons is ripe. When that bottom, that bed there, it's nice and cream colored right there. That's another good indication that watermelon is ripe. Now, how confident are you on this well, one? Well, that's my, my thing. There. I'm taking <laughs> a shot here, and uh, the saying this one is ripe. I think it is. We'll see. You never As know you mentioned, watermelon. you said them first ones is, is kind of hard to tell. It is. It is. For some reason or other, when that, before that vine... And when it, if, you can also, if it pops open right, that makes pops. a certain sound if yeah, it's right. You know, but it's, that's after the fact that you take it. Yeah, after it's oh, too late. Nice mm. Mm. Look at there, look at there. Now this one could have stood another day or two, but this going to be fine. Yeah. See, I've, been, I've been looking forward to trying them sangria well, watermelons. Ready. They are ready, and I'm going to tell you, for the 4th of July, we're going to have plenty of watermelon. Let's taste you, that right you, there. You're liable to eat more than one a day, ain't you? I ate one yesterday. I right by myself. Yeah, gum. That's sweet. They're pretty good. They are. That's real good. Yeah. So I've like, been pleasantly surprised with my watermelons this year. Never grown these all sweets before. They've done well. Now, I will tell you one thing. I don't know that they got as much vine as some of the older open pollinated varieties. But it could have been me. I could have not fertilized mine early on like I should have. I did. I did, was not proud of the amount of vine I had when more than started putting on. So I went out there and started really fertilizing, pumping it to them, trying to create more vine. And I did. Things turned out well. But I, I could tell early on that I had some issues there with my fertility. So I had to kind of go back and reboot on that. So you don't think this variety just has a smaller growing habit? I don't know. That's my point. I don't know yet. I think I'd have to do some more research on that. And grew some more out. I think it was definitely a little sweeter than a crimson sweet normally is. Uh, maybe. Um, that's 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 good. If you had that cold, that would uh that would be even better there. Now some folks like to put salt on the watermelons. No, I don't I don't, no, I don't, do, I don't do any of that. Your mom, your mom put salt on one. Drives me insane. That's a good way to ruin a watermelon. Yeah, she's gonna have to get around the corner where I can't see her to do it. I don't like watching that. Yeah. I'm just gonna continue right here. That's pretty good. I I, I, I have to be careful where I'll be done just forgot about the show altogether and wanna eat that. You know how a horse a colic sometimes. Yeah. Colic is when the belly get a bad belly ache. Horse can't take it. This right here caused me to colic. Oh yeah? Yeah. I have to be careful. I eat about three a day is all I can eat. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty considerable amount of watermelon. Yeah. Um we were talking about canning earlier, and I thought this was funny. So we did some, me and the wife did a little video series showing how we put up tomatoes. And I don't know what it is about canning, because I've seen this on other channels that do canning videos as well. But canning is one of those things in the garden that is an extremely polarizing subject, and people got very strong opinions on how you should do it. And, and I'm always the belief that there's more than one way to skin a cat. But uh, anytime, whether it's on our channel or anybody's channel, we post a canning video, uh, and one of the commenters called them this, I thought was interesting, the canning police comes out. They're going to tell you, well, you, you really need to do it this way. You didn't do them jars right. You need to have this and that and there. And uh, it was just interesting because as soon as we posted that video, boy, you got canning experts from all over the world. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways to do that kind of stuff, you know? Tell you what I see with canning. Most people are intimidated by it. Right. Especially people that was, grew up in the city and, and never had anybody to teach them. Now, it's not for us because your mother come off a farm and she just, it's second nature to her. It's never been an issue, done it all the time. And it, it doesn't bother me either. But a lot of people are intimidated by the process of being in charge of their own food and storing their own food. And it really works on a lot. You got to overcome that. Now there's a lot of books out there that you can read, a lot of research you can do, and I would encourage you to do that. But the number one thing is just don't be intimidated by trying to do some canning. If you mess up, so be it, it's no big deal. You're going to know it before too long because that jar is going to turn a bad funky color and it's going to happen every now and then you're going to have to throw one away. 
of the rewards is out there and I'd encourage you if you do not know how to can get out there and take a leap of faith and do some of it and you'll just be so proud of what your results are and can is one of those things you can read as many books watch as many videos as you want but I think it is best learnt firsthand if you can find you somebody who's you know been doing it for years and just go spend a couple days with them I think uh uh, that is going to be the best way to learn it. Now, everybody doesn't have that privilege. That gives you a little more confidence in what you're doing if you got a coach sharing it. That's a right. Mentor, a mentor. Now, I don't know if every town has this, but we have what we call a cannon plant here in town, uh, which makes it real easy. If you ain't got all the equipment at your house, you can go there and uh, and do stuff, put it together. My wife's grandma does that. I'm not a big fan of cannon plant. Yeah. I yeah. can go into details on that, but I'm not going well, to uh, yeah. leave it alone. We'll leave it alone. Couple more things before we get into it. I brought you some, uh, I got a video coming on Instagram probably later this week, Saturday or Sunday or so, where I show step by step how I like to make a BLT. And I made, <laughs> and uh, I made me a monster one last night. And uh, I've been using them big red snapper tomatoes, but I made one with these right here. And those, that's, that's perfect. Speaking of BLTs, Ashley Spires, which lives up in middle Georgia, is a bit growing a big garden this year, and Ashley called me the other day. He grew the celebration tomato this year. Mm -hmm. He said, Greg, I bought more bacon than last month than I have in the last two years. <laughs> <laughs> Tickled me about that. He said, I have bought bunches of bacon because he's made a bunch of BLTs. And that celebration tomato is one I've never grown. He said it's done really well for him. Yeah, it's pretty good. So I brought you them right there because I know you didn't have any of them. That's that Chef's Choice Orange. And I look forward to uh, the chef's choice for a, for a, it's a hybrid indeterminate, but doesn't have as, as high disease, great a disease package as some of our others. But considering that, uh, it's been a winner for me. I kind of had my expectations going into it. And there are several, there's a chef's choice pink, a chef's choice red. And I look forward to adding uh, those other colors of this variety next year. I really have enjoyed the orange so so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I ate me a big old BLT last night. A few more things. Um, don't forget about the, the testimonial thing. We'll put a link below there. Give us a little testimonial with your phone. Just, just to be clear on that because we've been getting some videos in. We're looking for a testimonial here, not necessarily a garden tour. Just all you got to do is just sit down in front of the camera and uh, tell tell us why you like our products or why you like us or whatever. So just just a little testimonial there it doesn't have to be no more than a minute or too long. Be honest. Be honest. Yeah, definitely want that. The last thing is, and everybody don't get too excited about this because it's probably going to take us about a year to do it. But we want to put together a row by row recipe book that includes a lot of the recipes that we have shared and talked about on the show in addition to... Yeah, there's a lot of people out there in our row by row group that are absolutely wonderful cooks and are good gardeners that got a lot of things to share. I mean, I pick up on a lot of things out there from time to time. So we want to, we want to be able to take the whole bunch and put together something we think will be Huge benefit. Yeah, and we want the book to kind of be focused on things you can make from things you can grow in your garden. Uh, you know, not not that every recipe you're gonna be able to get every ingredient from your garden, but the the each recipe won't be centered on something that we harvest from the garden. And so, a couple ways you can submit uh, your recipes. You can email them to cussserve at hosttools.com, or you can snail mail them to us. Uh, to our address there, which you can find on our website if you'd rather just snail mail it written down. Just make sure you provide plenty of detail because we're going to have to cook all these and do some photography. And so uh, we need to try them out ourselves and cook them and, and make sure you give us plenty of instructions there. I will give you this. So we're, we're looking right now having kind of four main categories in the recipe book. And I'll give you those. Uh, so we're going to have a pickling and preserving section. So if you've got any good pickling and preserving recipes, send those. We'll have a section called Southern Favorites. No drops, huh? Yeah. We are in the South, so we'll have a section called Southern Favorites. We're going to have a section called Soups and Such. A lot of things we grow, we make a lot of soups from. And, and then we'll such, go, and, and, such. and such. And then we're going to have a section that I like to call Snack Attack. Yeah. A little quick... <coughs> 
you know, snack dishes. We eat a lot of those on the show. So if you have anything, any good recipes from things you harvest in your garden that would fall into either of the four categories, um, send us an email or send us some snail mail and um, we'll consider it for our recipe book we're putting together. All right. On today's show, man, we got people, it, it's, it kind of blows my mind, but I know it blows their mind in spring when we're planting stuff and they've still got snow. And this time of year, we got people already planning for their fall garden. I'm thinking, man, we still got three months of just burning hot weather. I ain't even thinking about fall. I'm just trying to try to survive the summer. But a lot of people are already thinking about fall and a lot of people are thinking about how to get their fall plot or they're plotting good shape for fall well but not only that but even even where we're at we got crops that are coming off right now we're you know back of my mind i'm thinking well i'm gonna plant beets back here or i'm gonna plant um i'm gonna plant greens back in this plot so you need to be thinking way ahead on that and understand how you want to treat that soil and what preparations you want to make for that fall even if you are in zone eight or nine right and so right now is prime time if, if you're you know that summer slot not everywhere in the country but a lot of the country is hard to grow anything during that real hot summer slot where we're at yeah and so that's a really good time to rehab and refresh your soil for your fall garden or even if you don't grow a fall garden go ahead and start that soil rehab process and then you could turn around and plant a cool season cover crop uh in the fall yeah now sometimes we get a little pigeonholed about thinking of everything's where we are right i rode through the countryside of kentucky yesterday mm -hmm. and i seen corn this big i did and i seen tobacco this big i hadn't seen the tobacco in a long time they grow a different tobacco than when we did but i seen several fields of tobacco that was this big and several fields of soybeans just like that so that's great see i got a second crop of sweet corn about to be ready right and they got some ain't even knee high yet. Yeah, but I mean, we just get, we don't understand some right. We forget where we're at in this whole zone thing. Right. And the people are just a lot different. And you mentioned, you know, they have a they have a hard time getting one crop off. Mm -hmm. up north, you take Ohio, Michigan up in there, it takes every bit of the summer to get a crop of tomatoes off. Right. Because they turn cool so quick and they didn't warm up till later on. So it's just different we you know what we do will work everywhere you just gotta tweak it to what works in your particular area your zone right R regardless of zone though i think between spring or summer whatever your growing season is and between your fall planting it's always a good idea to throw in or squeeze in a warm season cover crop yes it is but it, it's i would have to say this right here it is m more important on pass it is a lot more important to do it in the south than it is up north, way up north. Way up north, they have a harder time getting that in. Now here in zone seven, eight, and nine, it is absolutely amazing what those cover crops can do for you. And you have those time slots to get them in. So many benefits to cover crops, and we'll talk about some as we talk about the individual ones today. But just in general, uh, like I always say, it gives your soil a nice refresh, a nice reset. One of the big things is it's going to break a lot of those pest and disease cycles, and it's going to help out your pest management so much because it's going to break those cycles because you're not having something out there that's making those pests amplify uh, exponentially out there. And I, I, I won't say that cover crops eliminate the the need to rotate your crops but if you do a lot of cover cropping you can have a little tighter rotation because you're constantly doing that refresh and reset there absolutely so we're going to go through some uh all these warm season and now we don't there are other ones out there you can plant but we're going to go through the five that we carry that we really like to use and now talking about summer or warm season cover crop. Warm season cover crop. So, you know, the frost is going to kill them. If you're going to plant uh, this, then, and, and then turn around and plant a cool season one. And for us, around October is when you'd go ahead and get that cool season. So, these are the ones you want to plant right now in the summer, early fall. And I, we're going to separate these into monocots and dicots. And the reason we say that is because there's been a lot of research done out there. And this is not, this is not going to hurt anything if you don't follow this rule. 
there's been some research supporting the fact that when you're doing your cover crop, it's best to follow a monocot with a dicot cover crop or follow a dicot cash crop with a monocot cover crop because monocots and dicots, lot, there's lots of things that make things different between monocots and dicots, um, but they each have their own different set of mycorrhizae. So it gives you a wider <coughs> diversity of mycorrhizae or a fungal associations in the soil there is just going to benefit your overall soil health and diversity. They is monocot and dicots is a way to distinguish the difference of your plants. There's actually a third one out there that we won't get into. We're going to keep it pretty straightforward here and use the monocots and dicots. Now monocot, I have a corn leaf here to the... give you an idea of what a monocot is. A monocot has the veins that run up and down. All your grasses and your corns are considered monocots. That's what we call parallel veination. Yep. So you can see there, those veins run up and down. And like then, grasses, corn, grasses, wheat, and we'll get into that in a yeah. minute, but wheat and grasses. Now this is an ochre leaf and this is a dicot because those veins shoot off from main They're stem. Branching. Right have a more a lateral vein on. Early on, back in the day, they developed herbicides on the monocot and dicot. And you can still go back and see a lot of those old herbicides such as 2,4-D, that's the way they distinguish what it will kill and what it will not. So if you ever see brush killer or 2,4-D or anything like that, you know it's going to work on a dicot, but you can safely spray it on a monocot. Yeah, a few more differences between, well, the name itself, monocot means one cotyledon, which refers to the structure of the seed. Dicot means two cotyledons. Your root structure is also going to be different. Your uh, dicot is going to have more of a tap root, where these corn and stuff, if you ever seen the root structure, has more of a fibrous root system. Uh, you know, several other differences, uh, if they do flower, the, the flowers look a little different. The main thing is the leaf venation, the root structure, and the number of cotyledons. It's so, a different kind of plant, basically. And they ain't used to getting all hung up on that, so if you don't understand it or if yeah. you don't want to, that's okay. We're going to explain it all to yeah. you so you can get it. This is not a golden rule, but it's something we've been trying to do the last few years once we saw that research on it. So, our monocot cover crops, we got two here. We got your brown top millet and your sorghum sedan grass. <coughs> now, these have a pretty similar growing habit, you know, relatively. Um, they're both going to look a little bit like corn out there. Um, the sorghum sedan grass takes a little longer. You know, it's closer to 80 to 100 days. Your brown top millet can be 60 to 70 days. I like the sorghum sedan grass because you can go in there and mow it at about two, one to two foot tall and it will just keep growing back, keep growing back and you just continuously depositing this green manure or organic material in the soils works great that way. The sorghum sedan grass also has some nematode suppression qualities about it which is good. The brown top millet is especially good for sandy soils that have been worked pretty hard in the spring. Mm -hmm. uh, it does a really good job of refreshing those. And if you like, you know, if you live out in the country somewhere and want to have your little fall bird shoot, that brown top millet will bring them in like nothing you know, else. If you're into bird watching and want to feed them birds, yeah, that's a good one. Or if you got chickens. If you got chickens and you're going to let your chickens graze it, this brown top millet, they will eat that stuff up. Yep, I found a covey of turkey down the road down there at our other place yesterday from there. Turkeys would love that too. That's right. So these monocot cover crops, pretty much everything in it, the only, the only monocots we really grow as far as vegetables is corn, right? That we can think of? Yeah. Yeah. So anything, squash, peas, basically anything you've got growing, if you want to follow this monocot, dicot rotation, you would plant you one of these right here. Your brown top millet or your sorghum sedan grass. Now let's talk about our dicot cover crops. And we've got three of those here. And these are going to be the ones, now I said this isn't a golden rule or anything, but these are the ones that I'm going to follow my corn with. Yeah, let me expand on this just a minute. So we said a while ago that wheat is a, uh, let me see that book, wheat. The wheat is a monocot, and it is. 
However, this butt wheat is a die card, so it's a little bit of a little bit of a difference there, and I don't really know why it is, but that butt wheat is not actually a wheat. If it was, it would be a monocot, but it's called butt wheat, but it, it does have a broad leaf. So, well, we get a lot of questions from people, and I'm sure we will on this video here. If you have any questions, always put those in the comments. People ask, what kind of cover crop should I plant? And besides factoring in the monocot, dicot thing, it, it's really a function of how much time do you have. Not only that, but how much equipment do you have? How are you going to manage that cover crop? It, it, indeed, indeed, certainly. So what's your gap there? You know, for us, the gap between when we're going to stop growing vegetables here pretty soon and when we're going to be planting fall is probably wider than most people's. You know, the further you go up north, that gap's going to close. You may only have a month or so. And so these have different kind of maturity dates. And uh, depending on what that gap is for you, you may want to do a different cover crop. As far as the dicots go, the earliest one of all the cover crops is the buckwheat. And, and that's going to come off and flower in four weeks sometimes. Uh, it's really, really fast. Buckwheat is a phosphorus scavenger. The bees love it. It's just a great fast cover crop. So if you got a short window there, I'd say buckwheat is the way to go. And the other thing is buckwheat is probably the easiest to turn over, incorporate, and turn around. Yeah, it has a real thin thin or small stem to it. It's not very fiber. <clears throat> it's easy to get rid of. I can even, I don't even have to use my riding lawnmower. I can take my push mower and go in there, take down a cover crop of buckwheat. You usually don't have to till it but once where some of these others you might have to till it more than once you know it just turns over really fast and really there's quick. not a friendlier cover crop for pollinators than the buckwheat yeah and, and and even though it's short term only four weeks there this do wonders for breaking that pest and disease cycle mm -hmm. keeping those things from multiplying out yep. there the other one we got here is the sun hemp and this is actually our probably our most popular. We sell more sun hemp than we do any of the other ones. Yeah, well, sun hemp's kind of a thing right now. You know, we all kind of go in cycles, and we thought, think everybody's the cat's my, meow. Uh -huh. Sun hemp is the head of the cover crop. All that's all the buzz right now is to sun hemp, and these reasons for that. It does some pretty amazing stuff. All you farmers are using it. Uh, man, food plot. You talking about? A, if you got a deer problem, you don't want to use this stuff. Deer absolutely love it. Yeah, the commercial, even the commercial produce guys around here have started using this stuff. And there's some reasons for that. We know it's a legume, so it's a, not a nitrogen fixer. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, I read an article on that that the University of Florida did some pretty in-depth research on it. Up in North Florida, they had some uh, a test station in Tallahassee, and they found that sun hemp broke the army worm cycle huh now i know it has uh helps with harmful nematodes mm -hmm. but that's the first time i've heard that but this if you want to go online and look it up you can look up uh university of florida uh sun hemp research and you can read that article it's very interesting that it broke we knew from our own gardens that we didn't have some of the pest pressure that some of these other people do with our cover crops we didn't really know why but now we're starting to understand these cover crops have actually had you know, been tested and they actually do break those cycles of those worms. So that's right. that's interesting. Now the sun hemp of all the ones uh, of all the cover crops we have, if you let it get full grown, it's the hardest to kind of get rid of. It has a very fibrous stem on there. Once it gets four to six weeks old, so it can be kind of harder to get rid of. It does more for the soil than anyone I've ever seen before. I've got some planted now, I planted some last year, and I followed last year my oaks behind, behind the sun hemp, and I didn't put one ounce of fertilizer on them, and they were some of the prettiest oaks I ever had. So you need your kind, if you got a big plot of this stuff, you need your some decent, decent sized mower uh, to get it knocked down. Now I did experiment last year with cutting this low, kind of like I do the sorghum sedan grass, and it does re, you know, grow back pretty quick if you just want to continually cut it and mow it and leave it short. Um, it, it, it can take it and it will keep growing back. It's also data link neutral. What that means is you don't have to plant it and wait on the days to start getting shorter before it blooms and does its thing. You can plant it short uh, early on and get rid of it before the fall gets here and plant you another one. Or you can plant it up to 45 days before frost and still get some beauty out of it. 
The last one here, and this is what I'm actually going to, where I have my Avalon sweet corn, I about got it ready. Uh, I'm about to plant me a cover crop with these iron clay peas right there. Uh, peas are a nitrogen fixer. Uh, should help with that corn, you know, eating up all that nitrogen, kind of replenish the soil there. Um, we're going to plant these thick. The peas are going to give you some really good weed suppression. Anytime you plant, whether it be a winter pea in the fall or these iron clay peas, man, you plant them thick, they're just going to cover the entire area. Hopefully give me some pigweed, some crabgrass suppression. This, these iron clay peas are known for really bringing in the beneficial insects uh, once they start blooming there, helping out with that. And the last thing is with th these, you know, I'd say right, right behind the buckwheat, these are going to be one of the easiest to incorporate as well. Yeah, that's what I was fixing to tell you. You know, we got the two legumes here, which is the sun hemp and iron clay peas. The iron clay peas are, peas are a lot easier to get rid of than the sun hemp is. If you definitely want to go with a legume and you think you may have some problem incorporating it back into the soil because you got limits on your equipment, then the iron clay peas may be the one to go with. That's right. That's right. So lots of good options here as far as your warm season cover crops. Just to recap, things to consider are monocot following a dicot, dicot following a monocot. That's not a steadfast rule, but if you can work with that, it's going to help your soil. Think about the time, the window you got. You know, if you only got a month, you don't want to plant some sun, hemp, and peas because they're going to take 90 to 100 days. Think about your window and think about how you're going to incorporate it or get rid of it. Some of this stuff, you cut it down, you can tarp it and be fine. Some of the other stuff's going to require a decent sized mower to knock it down. Yeah, if you have a rotary mower, a tractor, let me have that sun hemp just a minute. If you have that. That's right here. Okay. If you have a rotary mower, and you have availability to get rid of it. Bush got, hog. Bush hog, you got to be growing that sun hemp. You'll be amazed at what it does. Now, if you're limited on what you can grow, cause you don't have nothing but a lawnmower, a little small tiller, I tell you the ones you want to really concentrate on. You want to concentrate on your iron clay peas, sorghum sedan grass, and your buckwheat. Those are the three I recommend for somebody that's got a little bitty backyard and they, and they don't have a lot of equipment. Yeah, yeah, that sorghum sedan, you can mow it with a push, you know, I like to get out there with my push mower. I can do that on my plots in no time. And don't think you're just going to have one. I mean, I very well may, and I definitely recommended it. If you're putting in a couple crops right now, you got time to get two of them in. So you can do a monocot, you can do a sorghum sedan grass and then follow it with a sun hemp or vice versa. You got plenty of time left to get two of these warm weather cover crops in before fall and get that soil pumped up boom boom going going so if you have any more cover crop questions you know let us know in the comments below also i know there's a lot of people since we've been doing this show since we've been doing a lot of videos a lot of people are or have just started cover crop and I'd love to hear how some of you out there have experienced the benefits of cover cropping already if you don't mind you know share that in the comments so other people can read it and uh, maybe to inspire them to start cover cropping as you well. Now one thing that we didn't cover that we have covered in the past is sunflowers. Sunflowers. I got a video we did a video on that mine are coming up good we'll talk about that more uh, as they get going but yeah some sunflowers have a lot of uh, benefits as far as cleansing the soil any impurities in there uh there's a lot of research out there on, on how good they are unless you get the side benefit of having that beautiful flower <clears throat> and pollinators and everything all right we got a few questions from last week's show and if we answer your question on the show send us an email to cussserve at hosstools.com we'll send you a nice little prize question number one is for travis is from joy rocks i'm looking for a speckled butter bean Help a girl out, y'all. I meant to bring a packet here, but I forgot. We got a speckled butter bean. That's a dang good one. You probably don't want to plant it right now in the heat of summer, but you can turn around and plant it in the fall. It's called Christmas Lima Bean. And uh, if you like a good, those speckled butter beans tend to have a little more nutty flavor to them than a traditional lima bean. Really, really good in soups. Really, really good for the fall. They also freeze well. Uh, you can let them dry and uh eat them that way or you can you know pick them fresh and shell them and eat them that way but uh it's on our site called christmas lima bean uh it's a sp red and white speckled one and i've grown it in the spring and fall one of my favorite ones it's a running trellis trellis so you can grow it in a pretty small space if 
you got a fence in your backyard or a cow panel or a hoarding over, whatever you want to let it climb on, yeah. it's a good one. I've been growing it for years. You remember when y'all was little bitty fellers, we <laughs> we did some trellises one time out of some bamboo. bamboo. I and then we had to get on a ladder to get up there. Yeah. Learn my lesson. You don't want to make a trellis taller than what you can reach up there to get, because then you got to get on the ladder. Yeah. Number two is from Avery Case, and he says, "Hey, Greg and Travis, my question is: When you see your corn tassels start to pop out, how far out is it before you start picking?" Ooh, normally about two to three weeks. It depends a little bit on your variety. It depends a little bit on the weather that you have and the heat units that you're, that you're getting at that particular time. But a good general rule is two to three weeks. Wouldn't you say so? I would say so. Uh, I got my temptress right now has tasseled out. That stuff got eight foot. It's the tallest sweet corn I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got ears on it. Some two ears per stalk, some instances there. And... Uh, I'd say two to three weeks as well. Just a side note on that, when you corn and you got them tassels and you got them ears out there, especially this time of year, people always don't know how long to water. Two times this week, two times I have let my drip run overnight on that corn. Yeah. And it ain't, they soak it right up just as quick as you can put out there. Well, it's an important time for that corn when that tassel put on there not to be stressed out. Yeah. You don't want to see them leaves folding up. All right. We got one more? Yeah, excuse me. I mesmerized by my watermelon there. Uh, yeah, Jim McMillis wants to know what would be a good bean or pea to plant for fall and when should I plant them as on 7B. Love your stuff and show. So beans for fall. Well, you, you can grow beans in the fall. We have done pretty good with it over the years. Last year, I had a little issue because I went with my normal timing and we had that real, real late, late summer and I had some issues. But for the most part, we're usually able to grow a decent pole bean crop uh, in the fall. My number one on that list is probably rattlesnakes. Uh, they do really good. That Kentucky Blue that I grew this spring would make another good one. Um, if you're looking at peas, <clears throat> and we have had in the past, as far as field peas go, we have almost had better luck with them in the fall than in the spring sometimes. Well, I was actually speaking with someone the other day, and they, 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 <clears throat> they said the same thing, that they had better luck growing them in the fall. It goes against conventional wisdom to think you can grow something in the fall and have less disease pressure than you do in the springtime. The first time you experimented with this, I told you you lost your mind. And you ended up growing a better southern pea crop in the fall and you didn't have near the southern curio problem that we did in the springtime. And since then, I've heard of other people having the same issue. The only thing I can comprehend is somehow that that cycle gets broken out later on in the fall of the year and that that curio is the population has dwindled down. But it's a fact, a lot of people are having more, uh, more luck growing them in the fall. Yeah, so as far as field peas go now, every year we're going to be pretty short on field pea seeds come fall because we have to, we get a new crop of those every year. They don't carry over as well. But uh, what we do have right now, uh, the best one I would recommend, I've grown the summertime pink eye. In the fall, it does really good. We're out of those. We got that top pick pink eye, which would make a great uh, field pea uh, to plant in the Southern fall. Pea. Southern pea, yeah. We've also got a few crowders left, uh, but that I would go with that top pick pink eye. Zippers have been going for a while. Yeah, you ain't gonna find zippers anywhere. Number four, from Mike Nimick, and he says, hey guys, wondering if you could give some tips on how to cure winter squash for storage. Mm. So in the past few years, and I will say this right here, in the past few years, I have become a huge fan of winter squash. Mm -hmm. I think it's something early on in my gardening career that I overlooked and missed out on. That we I didn't do that growing up, did we? We didn't, and I, I, I really regret that now because I, I have enjoyed them. I think it's something that all gardeners should be growing. And you talking about the perfect homesteader food? That's it. Now, they can be a little bit complicated or it's a little bit different because you have different types of winter squash and some of them need cured and some of them don't. Now, some of my favorites that I like to eat do not need stored and they are the acorn, spaghetti squash, the delicata, which is on the top of my list, the sweet dumpling, and our owl squash that we're growing now do not need any stored. So you just simply let you mean them get, curing. I mean it's curing. You simply let them get ripe on the vine, you pick them, and you can eat them right away. 
Now, they are the pepo variety or pepo species, I guess you would say. Mm -hmm. Now, they are some out there that do need storing, and some of those are the Cure, Hubbard, that need curing. Cure, yeah, storage curing. Need curing, and those would be the Hubbard, the Kabochi, and the Butternut. A general rule is the ones that need curing, and some of these need to cure out for six to eight weeks, store a lot longer than the ones that do not need curing. Mm -hmm. When you do cure them, they have some things on the internet you can read. You got to keep them at so and so degrees and all this right here. The best thing to do is just treat them like you would your onions or your potatoes. Put them out of direct sunlight, put them out there and let them cure for a few weeks. And dry, cool. Dry, cool. Dry, cool. In a dark environment. That's what I use. Yeah, those non-pepo winter squash, uh, like the Seminole, the the um, butternuts, those those ones you mentioned, almost like a sweet potato. You know, you harvest sweet potatoes, they do taste better. About four to five, six weeks, you let them cure a little bit. Yeah. Let those sugars kind of mature in there. Right. Whereas those pepo species are pretty much ready to go. Yeah, and some of these these hubbards can store up to you know five six months. I've heard people right, get, getting a year or two off Seminoles yeah. before. I, I can't get that long off of them, but uh, I've heard of it happening before. All right, good questions there. And I uh, <clears throat> hope everybody enjoyed the show tonight. If you did enjoy the show, make sure to hit that like button, hit that share button, give us a big thumbs up there. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button and I hit that no bell button so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy this video, check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really enjoy those as well. Ones that he's done in the past on watermelons like Man, that. I wish I could share this watermelon with each and every one of y'all out there. Y'all have a good one. Good stuff. See y'all.